near-death experiences, you don't really come back the same. It's kind of hard to interact with the world the same way. I make paintings out Doors. I make paintings in, in wild places, uh, specifically up at the top of the mountains on ridges and peaks in the winter and, uh, and on the lake shore, very untouched lake shore and in the forest sometimes. Uh, so I'm, I'm in pursuit of wild places and an intense outdoor experience for the content for my work. People can think what they want. Uh, I know that that was a real experience. Like it's, it was as real as like pouring a coffee in the morning and burning your tongue. Three days later, I was in the studio and I was kind of looking at a regular rectangular flat painting and it just morphed right in front of my eyes. It morphed into this three-dimensional shape and I literally walked up to the canvas and unscrewed the stretcher and sliced off the, the canvas that was on it and rebuilt it and built the first shape. And uh, it was amazing. It was like this gift from the other side, a total gift. Well, we're getting close to the spot. I guess part of me wants to remember, like I don't want to forget the experience. And then as I come here, I kind of remember more bits of it and like why it unfolded that way. And because it was pretty peaceful. Canoe painting is super exciting in the winter because it's so beautiful. And uh, the day I was out, day after Valentine's Day was a big storm, lots of snow, big waves. And I loved riding big waves in the canoe. It was super fun. And so I would just shoot for these, you know, big waves like that were that were tall. And I could get in in the trough and ride them out. It was just great fun. And I had a canvas on the on the canoe and I'd ride some waves and then search for a place to come to shore and paint. I was working at uh, school and I decided to walk home. It was a Fairly cold day, probably minus five. On the way home, I remember it being um, windy, maybe 10 knots that day, and it was a, a very high overcast. And I was out far, you know, out there. And the hugest, most perfect wave filled the canoe. And then I was just underwater and it was freezing within seconds. It was so cold and hypothermia set in really quick. And um, basically hypothermia kind of numbs you and puts you in kind of a dream state in a few different layers. So I just stopped thinking, just focused on my breathing. And, and uh, there was eagles flying above me, two of them. And they were circling up there and on my out breaths, I yell for help to the eagles. And at the time, they were like my brothers. I felt as if they were kin. And I was calling to them as if they were family. And then they went off and found Barb and Dick. And as I was walking home, I kept hearing an eagle in the, in the distance. And it was shrieking. And uh, the road, the highway up here winds around a bit, so you don't. Uh, I couldn't hear the sound all the time, but it kept coming back and coming back. And uh, when I finally arrived at home, which took me about 20 minutes, um, I walked in the door. And it was unusual enough so that I asked Barbara to come out and, and look at the eagle. He was low, and he'd been flying kind of through the front yard before Dick got home. And I was really surprised, because it's unusual. And I kept swimming to shore, and I kept calling to the eagles. Yeah, and I was aiming for this point in this tree, and I realized at some point out there, like, it could have been like 50 feet from shore, that I wasn't going to make it. But I was really calm. It was just like peaceful. And, and I had to let go, and I went and let go of my family and 
my daughter and my life and all the things that I had and also all the pain that I would create by leaving. I just I had to let that go. I couldn't hold on to that. And then I saw this tunnel down in the water made of light, this blue tunnel. And I was like, wow, that looks great. I'm swimming down there. And this huge, beautiful place where everything was, where all these beings were separate, but they were all the same. Like you could hear every being's thoughts. It was almost like a download of information and understanding about the nature of existence and the world. It just seemed to make complete sense. Like we all come to earth here and we forget who we are and why we came back to, to move forward and kind of just, I don't know. It's hard to put into words, but there's a definite purpose and it makes complete sense on the other side after death, before birth. It all makes complete sense and then you come here and we don't remember and we just get lost in our pursuits. Anyway, it was beautiful and uh, I came out of it. I was there for a million years, you know. It felt like forever that I'd been there and I felt myself sucking back up the tube and I was like, I don't want to go back. This is way better than life on earth. Then I was in the water swimming again. I hit shore here. Right there, and I only had one boot on and I was frozen. My left boot was on and so when my right foot hit the rock, I couldn't feel it. And I got jammed in the rocks and I got all cut up. And then I made my way over there and there's this little tiny grotto over there. It's like not even a grotto. It's like, but to me it looked like a cave. It looked like safety, that little nook in there. That was like somewhere, some shelter. It was ridiculous. As soon as I hit the, the physical world, I realized like I was barely, I was barely more than one cell determined to survive. Like I might've had one cell and the one cell was like, climb out and get warm. And I just like curled up and passed out from the cold because it was warmer in the air. And when you're warming up, when you're really cold, it really, really, really hurts. And my whole body was in this warming pain and I would scream and I would pass out at the end of the scream. I remember just no air left and I just pass out. And then I'd wake up and scream and pass out. And wake up and scream and pass out. We kept hearing this sound, which at first sounded like the wind and it sounded like maybe a cat meowing. We couldn't tell where it was coming from. And then slowly it, it became kind of a regular. And we kept listening and looking at the eagle. And then all of a sudden the sound sort of sounded like, Ew! and it sounded slightly human, but pretty inhuman. And we looked at each other and took another look and thought, I wonder if that's somebody because nobody's down at the lake usually at that time of year in February. And then we heard it again. And so then we thought, well, we better go. So Barb came down and she, she must have come off the path and like walked down here and I was standing, I guess, or I don't know. I must, I think I was sitting and she saw me and she didn't know who I was, but we knew each other. And then he turned around and he looked up at me with this horrifying face, with these enormous eyes and this distorted mouth. And he just screamed. And I was scared. I thought it was a crazy man. And I thought, well, I'll go a few feet farther and I could still get away from him if he tried to chase me. And so I kept going down farther and farther and then he turned around again. He had his head down between his knees and then he turned around and looked at me again but it was just this incredibly distorted look with this strange guttural sound and these enormous eyes and I looked and I thought, oh my God, that's Jeremy. And uh, she got me to 
try and stand up and take off some of my frozen clothes because of course my layers of clothes were like frozen hard and uh and she had a blanket and she put the blanket around me and then dick her husband brought down tea and those like warming packs kind of shake them and they warm me up and i sat in there for two hours with tea and warming packs and barb and dick were there and I was in and out of consciousness and they just kept feeding me tea and warming packs and I was coming out of the hypothermia to a degree because of the heat and the warming packs and the tea and then finally search and rescue crew came and they had a hell of a time getting down here it's all icy in February and they had a you know an aluminum cage stretcher and they strapped me in and they dragged me up by hand up like straight up the rocks into Barbara Nick's yard and into the ambulance. And I remember when Jeremy was in the ambulance just thinking, I hope he's okay, I hope he doesn't have brain damage, I have no idea, and he left. And then I got to the hospital and the doctor gave me a sandwich and told me to go home. I was home at dinner. Uh, I don't fear death. It's going to be really cool. You know, hopefully it comes to me when I'm old and I've had a full life. It's a transition into another experience. It's just like birth, the opposite end. <laughs>